I'm the uh, director of director of guest services uh, at Mercy Hospital here in Ardmore, and I'm also the executive chef. Um, I've been in the food industry for 27 years. Uh, started out a long, long time ago down in Waco, Texas. Uh, that's where I grew up, born and raised. And moved to Oklahoma about 11 years ago, and I've been uh, with Mercy for about seven of those years. Um, you and I are really not much dissimilar. Um, I am not professionally trained. I have not been to any culinary schools. I've applied for a few, um, but I have not attended any culinary schools. Um, I have one of the best jobs in the world in that I get to do my passion and my hobby every day. Okay. A lot of people have hobbies of sports or music or crafting or any of that kind of stuff. I really do love playing with food. Okay. Um, early in my life, I did a lot of screwing up with food burning food and destroying food, um, but that's part of the fun of it, I think. So, um, We're going to talk about menus, okay, and recipe ideas and all that kind of stuff, and it's probably going to generate a lot of thoughts with you. I'm going to close my presentation down a little bit early so that we have time to have some open dialogue about recipes and menus and, and all that kind of stuff. We are different in that you work in schools. I've never worked in a school. Um, I've worked in restaurants and I've worked uh, in the healthcare industry. Um, but the difference is that we are both working with declining budgets. Okay. Uh, every single year my budget goes down. Okay. Uh, every single year my patient count goes up and my budget goes down. Okay. So I know, I feel your pain. Okay. Um, when I when we started having this conversation about putting this kind of a workshop on together, um, this means a whole lot to me. Okay. Um, from two standpoints, and I'll tell you why this, to me, this is really important that y'all are here. Um, the first standpoint is <clears throat> as a parent. Okay. I have two small children that go to Ardmore schools. Um, and I know how much I struggle at home to try and get them to eat right and not eat Cheez-Its all day long or whatever it may be. Um, so as a parent, as anybody else in this community that is, that is a parent, this is extremely important to us, okay? Um, you are with our children, really sometimes as much as we are as parents during the school year. Uh, so from that standpoint, this is incredibly important to me. Okay? That's why I'm here. Second standpoint is more of a little bit of a professional level. Like I said, I'm in healthcare. Um, you get the, the duty of feeding children early in life, when they're healthy, when they're impressionable, when you can still teach them things. I get the wonderful task of having to try and educate uh, and change the habits of people that have had the same habits for 50, 60, 70, some odd, more years, okay? Um, and a lot of times those conversations, uh, I have two dietitians like Dina, um, and a lot of times those conversations are about as beneficial as having a conversation with this desk right here, okay? Um, people that develop habits that are bad are reluctant to change them, okay? Even when you give them the reality that they're going to die from their habits, they will not change. So, <clears throat> you've got the uh, ability to change minds because they're young and they're uh, <coughs> So I would challenge you that in the next two days, um, as long as, I don't know how long you've been in the, the school cafeteria industry, in these two days, try to have an open mind. Um, just like Jamie Oliver said in his piece, you know, we're, we're, the reality of where we are today is that those of you that with young children, there's a good chance that you will be burying your children because of obesity. They will not bury us, we will bury them. And that's the reality. Where we are. Um, 
Um, the other thing that's really disturbing to me, if you look at diabetes prevalence, the three counties that are represented in this room, Love County, Murray County, well, there's Johnston County too, right? And Carver County. Three of those four counties are number 73, 75, and 77 out of 77 counties in Oklahoma for diabetes prevalence. Okay. So we have the choice. We can continue to do what we're doing and bury our children. Or we can try to make some positive changes because our kids are that important to us and reverse that trend. I prefer to go the other route personally. So, that being said, let's talk about menus and recipes. I'm off my soapbox about you know, kids and health. Um, most of you probably do menus on some kind of a cycle, right? I do menus on a cycle. There's nothing different from what we do. Okay. So I'm going to give you just kind of some high level strategy of how we went through this. About two and a half, came about two and a half years ago, we changed a lot of stuff. <coughs> two years ago? No. Okay. Almost three years ago, <clears throat> all the Mercy Hospitals as a system, we realized that if we were going to be healthcare, that we need to promote healthy lifestyles. Okay? So we went through a process of changing what we offered in our cafeterias. Okay? Not to the guidelines or restrictions that you guys have had to, but we put kind of our own restrictions on ourselves. And we've made a lot of changes. So I'm gonna kind of recreate some of those changes for you because I think we are so similar in so many ways that we can draw off of each other. And going forward, tomorrow, and the day after that, and on August 15th when school starts, or August 21st when school starts, I am a resource for you, okay? In the back of your binder, it's got contact information for me. I want to be a resource to you going forward. Um, before we actually get into the menu portion, I want to ask you about, oh, these are some of the things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about students as your food ambassadors. Um, and I've changed this. What your, your, your slides in your book are a little bit different because I've made a couple of changes. We're going to talk about budgets and how to kind of let budgets drive how you write your menus okay, and how you develop recipes, how to develop your menu, how to branch out and think differently, and then how to adjust when it's not right. Okay? Or when the kids don't like something, they're not eating it. How are you, how are you going to adjust? So let's start with that number, that first one. I've heard a lot of comments already that the kids just won't eat it, okay? And I accept that, I understand that. I know what my kids will and will not eat. <clears throat> I would like to take, I'd like to walk you through getting kids to look at food a little different. <coughs> kids are very impressionable. We know that. We talked about that. So let's use that to our advantage. Okay. Uh, what we need to do, and what I, what I feel we, we don't have working for us right now, is we don't have kids talking favorably about the food that we serve. Right? Okay. So let's make them fans of our food. Okay. Well, that's a real broad statement. How are we going to do it? Got a couple of suggestions for you. And, and you know, this is stuff that you've got time to try this out. I'm not saying do it first day of school, okay? You're going to have to develop a plan with this. But I think you need to get kids involved in taste testing, okay? If you're going to go out and invest money to buy food, do the time to write a recipe or plan it out, whatever it may be, wouldn't you want to know if the kids are going to eat it before you spend all that money and time and make it? Okay, so is there 20 minutes in your work day where you can make 20 to 25 new things, not whole things, but I mean samples, 25 samples of one thing, 
talking to the teacher and go deliver a taste sample during class. How many teachers would go for that? I bet you they'd line up at the door for that. Okay. Now, let's think of that from a kid's standpoint. We're talking math, okay? Let's go to elementary school. You're gonna interrupt math class to bring me a snack. You are my new best friend. Okay? Um, so chances are, right there, they're gonna like what you made because you interrupted math class. Um, not only that, They have a mindset when they go to lunch, okay? You're disrupting that mindset, okay? You're putting the focus back on the food because by the time they step through that cafeteria door, they've already discounted your food, right? Okay. Let's hit them when they're, when they're not expecting it. Chances are they're gonna have a more realistic <coughs> response to your food. Now, let's say we would <coughs> take a yogurt parfait, something simple into a classroom, how are we gonna know the kid, what the kids thought? From the teacher. From the teacher, okay. Well, that's true. But are we gonna ask the kids to rate it A, B, C, D, E, F, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Well, let's think like a kid. Oh, look in the trash can, see what I got thrown away. We'll talk about that, hold that thought. <laughs> how about a smiley face sticker? or the straight across face sticker, or the frowny face sticker. And one little index card, put, you know, or two or three, put all your stickers on the card and return it to the cafeteria. If over half of them like that little snack, I'd start heavily considering how to mass produce that. Okay? You can do that, use your imagination. You can do that with anything, okay? And I'm gonna give you a little, I'll, I'll tell you a little story about thinking out of the box when it comes to food. <clears throat> Part of my responsibilities on a daily basis are to entertain physicians and administrative folks, community, civic leaders uh, that come to the hospital for a number of reasons. One thing that I, I get to do once a month is feed our executive board members. And uh, it's full of physicians and community leaders and stuff like that. So I always have to impress that group. Okay, it's job security. Um, how many of you been on Pinterest? Okay, good. A lot of hands. Use that. It's great ideas on there. Um, I was on Pinterest one night. And I found this one little neat thing, and the only thing that steered me to it just looked attractive. And all it was was strawberries and a piece of short, small little diced pieces of, of angel food cake stuck on a bamboo skewer, okay, and drizzled with chocolate. Neat. I like that idea. So, every time I have an upcoming board meeting, I have to start planning what am I going to do for this board meeting. What did I do last month so I don't repeat anything, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I start thinking. And one of the struggles that I always have when it comes to planning meals like that is dessert. Because a lot of people think of dessert as apple cobbler, chocolate cake, whatever it may be, okay? So trying to be creative and, and do new things with dessert is sometimes a struggle. So I got to thinking, man, that's fruit on a skewer, potential food cake. Pretty neat idea. Well, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do it a little bit differently. Using what I already had in the kitchen. I had some fresh raspberries. I had some strawberries. I had the angel food cake. So I started putting together all these little skewers with fresh fruit and angel food cake. <coughs> Berries. Drizzled it with chocolate, made it look nice. And I got thinking, wow, they're going to love that. And now I've got 450 bamboo skewers that I have no use for. So wait a minute. Let's do a skewered lunch. The whole lunch is going to be on a skewer. Wouldn't that be fun? Because now it doesn't really matter what I put on the skewer. The uniqueness of it 
the, the whole lunch is on a skewer, made it different. Okay, so I made skewers with vegetables and chunks of chicken and beef and shrimp and all that kind of stuff, just random vegetarian skewers, you name it, put it on a skewer, grill it, serve it. It's one of the best meals they've ever had. I didn't spend a whole lot of money. I used exactly what was in my kitchen. All I did was go out and buy bamboo skewers for $2. But you made it fresh. That's right. And a lot of imagination. That's right. There's nothing different than what you can do with food if you just use your imagination. Okay? So, I just want to plant that seed with you about using students to become your ambassadors for food. Because if you go into a classroom, let's say, let's get past the first six weeks, nine weeks, however it's measured, all that kind of stuff. And you start going into a classroom every other week, okay? You're not going to break your budget, okay? Because you're only making for one class, 20, 25 kids. Mix it up by grade level, go to first grade one time, go to fifth grade one time, come back to second grade, go to eighth grade, whatever it may be. But you're going to start developing fans, okay? They're going to know, word's going to get around that school real fast. <laughs> hey, when are you going to come to our class? <laughs> well, I don't know. You might ask the teacher. Next thing you know, by the end of the year, you're going to have a school full of food fanatics. Okay? Because now you've made food exciting for them. And the chances of all this stuff that we're going to do in our cafeterias, that they're going to take hold of, increases. I'm not saying they're all going to be, bring me the veggies. I'm not saying they're all going to do that, but they're going to be more on board. They're going to be more engaged in these things if you involve them in the process. Okay? Parents as well. I hear from parents all the time. I don't think my kids get enough to eat. Well, they're getting enough to eat. My challenge to you, manage your trash cans. You're exactly right. You can gauge the success of the food you're serving by looking at a trash can at the end of the day. You see the same thing in there. Red flag. Okay. Okay. Seed planter. Okay. Some of this may be common knowledge for you. But I'm going to give you the state of food in our country. Presentation is called There's a Fly in Your Soup. How many of you have seen that loaf of bread? Let's talk about that loaf of bread. What sticks out to you when you look at that loaf of bread? All the fiber. All the fiber. 100% whole wheat bread. Four times the calcium. So if I'm mom and I'm shopping at the grocery store, I'm making a smart decision, right? By buying this bread for my children. Okay? Well, what most moms and dads don't do, that we've got a long way to correct, is look at the back of that loaf of bread. Those are all the ingredients that go in to that one loaf of bread. And I'll just, because I'm not a dietitian, you know, Correct me if I'm wrong here, but if you can't pronounce it, <laughs> it probably isn't good to be in that bread. How many of you have made bread fresh at home? How many of you use ferrous sulfate when you make bread at home? That's right. Now looking back to the left there, four times or all the fiber. What kind of fiber are they getting? <coughs> what does non-soluble fiber mean? Your body can't process it, right? So it's basically of no value. No. <laughs> Decreased value. No? Is it is it whole grain? But how many of these items are bad for us? 
If you're a parent, does that make you feel informed about the purchase you're about to make? Yes, sometimes. Unless you're a chemist or a dietitian, are you informed? No. No. Let's look at some of the, these are some of the consistent additives that are put in food and, and their purpose. Okay, uh, but I'll just highlight a few. Um, a lot of emulsifiers. You know what emulsifiers are? For bread, it's what makes it feel fresh all the time. Okay. Um, guar gum gives it resiliency, improves improves the texture, increases shelf life. Okay, that's why a fresh bread loaf of bread will sing fresh for a week. You know, whereas if you make bread fresh at home, by the end of the day, you're like, where'd my fresh bread go? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, those are just some of the additives that are commonly put in the foods that we buy at the grocery store, okay? Now let's break down a couple of those and what they're used for outside of the food industry. Uh, sodium alginate, um, I think I like this one. It's used in, oops, sorry. It's used uh, in the waterproofing and fireproofing fabrics. Does that make you feel better? Wonder why we have cancer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, ammonium sulfate. It's used in flame retardant compositions. Good to know that your loaf of bread will put out a fire. <laughs> Propylene glycol. My favorite. It de-ices aircraft. <laughs> Okay. Some of these things are even used in asphalt applications on roads. Make you feel better? Yeah, deodorants, sure. Remember what Amy Oliver said, that this is a three-headed battle, okay, from Main Street, home, and school. This is Main Street right here. Can you control that? No. You can't. But it's good, it, you need to know the things we can't control puts more emphasis on the things that we can control, which is what we're doing at school. Okay. Okay. No, I'm not going to scare you. Up. Let's talk about money. Because let's not lie to each other. Everything we do is based on money, right? We have less, less of it to work with every single year, right? So, how do you take a decreasing budget and use it to your advantage? First of all, you have to break things down into incremental value, okay? If you've got, just based on this, and I use real basic common numbers here just to be simple, if you've got $10,000 a month in your kitchen to use for food, that's your food budget. Break that down. How much you got a week? $2,500. How much you got per day? $500. Break it down by day part. How much do I have for breakfast? How much do I have for lunch? Okay. So let's say you're going to use 80% of your budget for lunch and 20% for breakfast, you now have $400 to spend for your lunch today and 200, 100 to use for breakfast, okay? Now, that's a whole lot easier to think of it from that standpoint than to say, how am I gonna spend $10,000 in 31 days, okay? And then, if you really wanna drill it down even further, take that $400 at lunch, you know how many meals you're gonna serve, break it down to how much you, you need to spend per tray, okay? And then adjust based on that. Do your purchasing based on that. Because if any of you purchase and then look at your budget, you're doomed. You're doomed. And how does that cost include? I think it's raw food cost. Now, I don't know how, I mean, this would be your nutrition director. 
is I don't know how your budgets are composed. If your paper goods are separate from your food purchases, if all that loops in together, I don't know. Um, but however your budgets are constructed, you need to bring all that into the table when you come to planning. Then you have to What's in my mind is scary about that 40% mark. When I started in the food industry back in 1985, something like that, our target food cost was 37% in restaurants. So in 20 some odd years, 3%? Wow. But can we control that? Unless you're real good at going before state legislatures and you got a convincing conversation, don't worry about that. We've got to work with what we've got. Okay. So now what, all we've done is take that budget and break it down to know what we have to work with in the most incremental way we possibly can. Now, based on, now you know how much money you have to spend. Now you want to start developing your core menu. What is a core menu? trying to develop a menu period. What's a core menu? Core menu, to me, are your common high-use items, okay? So for me, at the, at the hospital, it was chicken, fish, ground beef, ground turkey, meat. Those are my proteins. And then oranges, grapes, bananas, melons we even use for fruits. Veggies, carrots, broccoli, green beans, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, squash, artichokes, okay. Whole grains, rolls, whole grain pasta, garlic bread made on whole wheat bread, and then beverages, milk, and water. Once you know what you have to work with, then you can start trying to trim the fat, okay. So let's just say, for instance, <coughs> We're gonna narrow our, our stuff down to ground beef or ground turkey and chicken breast, pizza and pasta. Now, you wanna be diverse with your menu, okay? Um, again, speaking as a parent, chicken nuggets are served every single day. Or not every day, but once a week. Hamburgers are served at least once a week, if not every day. Um, in my opinion, from my experience, and granted, I deal with a different section of the public than you do. The more diverse I can be with the menu, the more interest I generate in the cafeteria, because it's not the same thing. Okay. So, if I wanted to be diverse, and I've developed this core menu, let's talk about chicken. What kind of chicken products do you carry right now? I'll take volunteers' hands. Chicken nuggets? I mean, come on, don't lie to me. You know you have chicken nuggets. Chicken. What else? <laughs> chicken strips? Uh, we got chicken. Chicken. Thank you, perfect. Jack, you, you just set the table for me. And you're buying all those individually, right? Okay. Okay. Um, the challenge for you. Unfortunately, in our society, we've become, and I'm going to use this word very loosely, but please don't take offense, it's lazy. Okay? Because if I spent my budget to buy nothing but four ounce chicken breasts, that's it, and develop everything around that four ounce chicken breast, you're going to save money, but the investment you have to make is in the time to prepare everything that you need to prepare around that four ounce chicken breast. Because how much of your money are you wasting by buying pre-breaded chicken nugget, pre-grilled, pre-cooked chicken strip, diced white chicken, already cooked? Is that tough? Yeah, it is. But the reality is, 
you have less money to buy your food with this year than you did last year. If you don't expect to change along with your budget, you're doomed. Okay. Same thing with fish. If we were going to do fish, would I go out and buy catfish, tilapia, cod, salmon, <coughs> trout? I'd narrow that down to maybe one or two and develop about six recipes around each one of them. And then you have two things you buy, but 12 menu items. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your menu's fat enough. Okay. So we talked about that. We're going to do chicken. You could make an herb roasted chicken with your four ounce chicken breast. You could make a grilled chicken with corn and black bean relish with the same chicken breast. You could make a teriyaki chicken with the same chicken breast. Sweet and sour chicken with the same chicken breast. Oven fried chicken. It's going to take a little bit of time in prep, but it can be done. And all of a sudden, or a barbecue chicken, you could do that too. All of a sudden, you've got two, four, six menu items, and all you've done is buy the same chicken breast. Okay. Now, we talked about the fish. Let's say, let's take cod. I could put Cajun seasoning on it. Cajun seasoning's inexpensive. Now, with kids, you might have to go easy. You might have to do something besides Cajun. Cajun cod, I could do a tem tempura baked cod. Lemon basil. Creole, depending on what kids like that, that version. You could do your own uh, in light of our new royal baby that was born yesterday and a uh, British version of oven fried fish and chips. Okay. And again, using that one purchased item, you've got six menu items that you could build on your menu. And you're saving money because if you can go out and find that commodity cod, that four ounce piece of cod or three ounce piece of cod on your commodities list, and you know you can buy in the big quantities, you're saving yourself money. Okay. Now let's talk about comparing frozen food, processed food to the fresh food. Okay. The difference between frozen and, uh, frozen and the fresh, or processed and the fresh, it's easy for you because there is nobody in this room that can't grab a Stouffer's lasagna and throw it in the oven for an hour and 20 minutes and walk away and come back and say, I prepared lunch today. <laughs> so my challenge to you is to think a little bit differently. Okay? Well, now we can do similar to lasagna all the basic ingredients are there, and I'm gonna make it better for them. You can use whole wheat baked ziti. Every vendor in Oklahoma offers it, okay? And you could turn that lasagna into that baked ziti. Everything that goes into lasagna is what makes baked ziti. So it's the same thing, dress it up, make it look fun, do a taste test with the kids, next thing you know you've got a video. And, in my opinion, the more things that you make yourself, you will take more pride in it. You will be more proud of it when you serve it out there in the cafeteria to the kids. <clears throat> Stir fry vegetables. Okay, Dina said we have to increase fruit and vegetable consumption. Is that going to happen by offering them carrot sticks? and celery sticks with a little bit of ranch, is that going to increase fruit and vegetable consumption? No. no. Food for thought. A survey was done several years, many, many years ago, in China. There was an American doctor that went over to China, did a, did a study, 20-year study, in 30 provinces in China. 
over 20 million people spanning this, these, these provinces. He and, a, he and a colleague of his that was Chinese based, they really focused their efforts on changing the diets of those people in those provinces. Okay? And they went with a vegetable heavy diet. Not vegetarian, vegetable heavy. And I'll give you an example of kind of put it in east and west terms. What's the expectation when you walk into a steak restaurant in America? Big, huge, fat steak, right? T-bone, New York strip. How much of the plate does it take up? Almost all of it. What comes with that steak, generally? A baked potato. How much of that does it, does it take up the plate? Almost the rest of it. Some places will give you a vegetable. If you do, you might get three slices of carrots, two slices of squash, or something like that, or one little florette of broccoli. Okay? That's the Western culture. The Eastern culture would have been a plate full of stir-fried vegetables with some shaved, low, I mean, trimmed meat. They flip-flopped the steak and the veggies. They gave you a lot of veggies and a little bit of meat. And I want you to know, those provinces in China, at the end of that study, reversed every single health trend led to death, diabetes, heart, vascular problems, some forms of cancer. Okay. So let's look at all of our processed foods. There are a lot of the ones that we use every day. You know, the frozen lasagna, the fr I mean, by frozen lasagna I mean the Stouffer's things. Everything that comes pre-made, you throw it in an oven, you wait a certain amount of time and boom, lunch is served. Okay. All those things have a lot of those additives and chemicals and all that kind of stuff in it. Chicken nuggets are processed. Uh, your beef bases, chicken bases, um, be careful with those. Um, I, know you, I know we have to add some flavor, but just be careful with them. Uh, French fries, tater tots. Uh, how many of your schools have combi oven technology? What school are you with? Plainview. Plainview, I know you did. Anybody else got combi oven? Okay. Um, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> combi it's ovens. It's wonderful. Com yeah, combi ovens in my mind are the future of food service. Um, I put on my suit and tie and did a one heck of a sales pitch to our administration uh, a little over a year ago to get combi ovens put in our kitchen. Um, by putting combi ovens in my kitchen, I have I have no fryers. I, we do not fry any food. Um, I've reduced my benefit cleaning from a monthly service to a semi-annual service, save me about $9,000 a year. Um, since we put combi ovens in, I have had zero workplace injuries, no slips and falls, no burns. Um, I got rid of my char boiler. We don't actually grill hamburgers, we do them in the combi oven. Combi ovens clean themselves. Wonderful. Which, ladies? Well, what is it? Yeah. Tell me you don't love that picture. You need to answer uh, my question. What is it? Okay, a combi oven is an oven that creates the environment that you want to create. If you want to steam vegetables, you can tell your combi oven, I want you to be a steamer. And kind of like steam a computer. Huh? Kind of like a computer. It, it is a big computer. It is a computer. Um, and it doesn't just steam vegetables. It reads where you are at at sea level and creates more of a blanched environment than it does a steam. How many of you steam broccoli and if you forget about it for two or three minutes, guess what you got? Mush. Darkest green broccoli? Mush. Call me up and we'll do that. Got a perfect green broccoli. Oh, you are the oxygen. <laughs> um, it's wagon you, train days. If you want your combi oven to be a convection oven, you can tell it I want you to be a convection oven. It'll do nothing but dry air in the oven. Guess what? It will mimic a fried environment without the use of oil. So I can do chicken strips, tater tots, french fries, and I challenge you to tell me that they didn't come out of oil. And it's even better than, than baking french fries, 
because you can see the natural oils drip out <laughs> of a french fry, whereas it's just going to sit on the sheet pan in an oven. What is it cost? <laughs> 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 you had to take the fun out of this presentation. They're going to range anywhere from twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars a piece. <laughs> but, but, now, that being said, let me give you raw cost, $25,000. I saved $11,000 a year because I am not buying fryer oil anymore, and I have saved $9,000 in Benedict clean. Bought me another. <laughs> Yes, it is also like 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 we said. It's a com it has a computer. It's run by a computer. So you also have the benefit of putting a flash drive in it and saving all of your recipes and settings to it. And then say you get transferred to another school, you take your little flash drive and you plug it into their into their combi oven, and you've got the exact same settings. It does exactly what to do. It adjusts to that sea level, and it just all your recipes be the same. It's smarter than Americans could ever think of. See, I'm not done when I'm So, save all the rest of those questions. Let's wrap this up. Okay. Let's talk about things that are going to make you successful in this whole big thing. One is, and I, and I cannot put enough emphasis on this, prep the shelf life. Okay? How many of you buy five pounds of onions at a time? Okay. If you go to the grocery store and buy three onions, how long are they going to be good in your refrigerator? Week? Two weeks? Three weeks sometimes? <laughs> Why would you buy five pounds of onions if you know two days later you're going to buy five pounds more? Or three days later you're going to buy another five pounds? Buy a 50 pound bag. Save yourself four dollars by buying, or even more, by buying that 50 pound bag of onions and all you take on in the risk is that if you don't use that 50 pounds up in two or three weeks you may throw away a pound or two i like that i like those odds okay. on the flip side if you buy strawberries you better be really aware of what time of year you're buying strawberries because if you buy them now, strawberries are going to be good for four or five days, maybe even longer. <coughs> if you buy strawberries in March, February, March, oh, you might get two days out of strawberries. It's not the season. <coughs> if the whole purpose of, of managing to shelf life and prepping to shelf life is to save you time. Okay. If you buy broccoli, fresh broccoli, by the case, it comes in ice. Okay. If you maintain the integrity of that product, it can last you a week, 10 days sometimes, instead of going out and buying broccoli florets. That you're paying somebody to cut those into florets for you. more fresh food that you can put on your menu, the better off you are. Because what we're at is we're in a reversal of trend. 25 years ago, most of the stuff in school cafeterias, in my cafeteria, was all made from scratch. Every bit of it was. Okay. And then we got, we got, we got lazy. And, unfortunately, stuff that's the easiest to make sometimes is the cheapest. Okay. That's the resistance we have to hold off on. Okay. 
Um, we want to communicate positively. I am a firm, firm believer, and I'm going to challenge y'all tomorrow when we serve all these kids from HFB Wilson. If you're proud of your food, if you've prepared your food, you should be the biggest fan of what you're serving. If you can't talk positively about what you're serving for lunch, how in the world do you expect them to feel good about it when they sit down to eat it? Thank you. Okay. So, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try and deceive you. There's some things on my menu right now that I wouldn't put on my priority list. But I'm going to win an Academy Award when you're in front of me telling you about how wonderful and how much time we spend making everything from scratch. And you've got to try this. Yeah, but even if something's not, let's say my family will be in our room tomorrow. I'm going to pick some more food. But I ain't going to lie, I may be mean, but I'm picking. Just because the other people in the group, they may not get paid to, I may not like, you know, I still may not like it. So. All I'm challenging you. I'm not expecting you to like every single thing you're going to make. I mean, we're human. We're not robots. All I'm saying is when those kids start coming in line, it, you're on stage. It's Disney World and you are on stage. You are now Mickey Mouse. And you don't want to go, oh! Okay. Um, next thing, be simple but diverse, just like we said with the chicken. Buy one thing of chicken, but change it up. Do six or seven things with that chicken. And then, like she said, watch your trash. That's a huge thing. Every day, don't just grab your trash and throw it away. Look at it. Well, what do you do with these kids? I mean, our school, we got kids that come through line, they grab their tray. They don't even go to the table. They just automatically dump it, throw their tray in the window. I, personally, that would be a discussion I've had with my principal and staff and teachers, uh, and I'd move your trash can. I mean, none of your trash If you go, if you, honestly, they just come through, they grab their trash, they dump it. I mean, they're talking about they're not even drinking their milk. And then you got some that just take your meat and just take it and just break it in their hands and throw the rest in the trash and then roll it up. I think that's a, I think you've got the perfect stage for your kid taste testing. Kid taste testing idea. We tried to do that. That may be something when we go to lunch, we're going to have some table discussions. You might get some ideas from some other folks. I know, I mean, like I've never been in the school business. I don't, I don't know how I would handle that other than. I have to bring stuff from my own house to make my own kids something different. We need to talk about your menu. <laughs> okay, let's talk about some things we want to avoid. Um, anything that is a one-step recipe probably isn't going to be a very good idea as far as cost is concerned. It's going to save you time. It's not going to meet your budget. Uh, portion control. If you don't have real strict guidelines, policies, processes around managing portions, not only are you not meeting the guidelines, but you're not going to meet your budgets. And then cheap ain't always good. Right. There's a difference between cheap and good value. Okay. Cheap um, is what people want to get rid of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cheap is also unhealthy. Yes. Um, I won't name any names, but there's one particular food distributor that's going around right now putting on quite a sales pitch to get a lot of people's business. Um, and they have a reputation for selling off. Stuff. Not good quality stuff, but anyway. Um, but best value, best value is what's going to meet your budget and meet your quality standards. That's good value. Okay. It's not bad. Okay, we've got about 30 minutes, and I wanted to make sure that we had enough time to talk about recipes, menus, things like that. Any questions? Open discussion. And then also anything, since we kind of had to cut Dean off a little bit short, if you got any questions for her, you know, let's bring those up now too. I have a question. Yes. Um, I know that you're not going to be able to do this, but I'm going to ask you to do it. 
Yes, ma'am. Like I said, desserts are one of the toughest things to try and make healthy changes to. Um, the only thing I would, I personally would suggest, and I'm not intimately involved with the nutrition guidelines and all that kind of stuff, I would put as much fruit in front of them as possible. I, I mean, It's, um, you know, the only other suggestions that I can tell you, and uh, these are things that, these are steps that I've taken. Um, not every cake has to be iced. Um, you can still put fruit with a dessert and not make it all fruit. Um, you can do some fruit alternatives. I think one example you're going to see tomorrow might pique your interest. Um, we're going to do a healthy version, basically, of an apple cobbler. Okay? Um, and, you know, you really have to, and this is really more for your child nutrition directors, you really have to be knowledgeable of pricing at times of year. Okay? For instance, we could have easily done this same dessert tomorrow, but done cherry. Okay? Problem is, cherries right now, way up there okay so we're going to use apples tomorrow and you know um, you know you just have to you, you, you're always going to be creative if you think that you're going to be able to write a menu and a every single day the kids are going to be jumping out of their shoes to get in the lunch line you're wrong if you think you're going to write a menu and you're not going to need to make some changes wrong. A menu is as flexible as the staff that work with it. Right? Uh, like I said, Tina knows from prime example, a lot of our menus, we have almost literally wadded them up, thrown them in the trash, and gotten six new pieces of paper out and started a brand new menu. Okay? Um, I would also challenge you Ask your kids what they want. And understand, you're going to get some questions that you, know, you just need to let go in one ear and out the other. But pay attention to what they want. Yes? with them a lot, they'll, those kids will talk to you. They'll say, Miss Nikki, you know, today, I just feel like I'm not feeling so good with you. But if you let them know that you're going to communicate with them on their level and not be judgmental to them, and just talk about what they really like, they'll let you know. And they really want they don't hammer. Well, she brought it up, one thing, because our whole kitchen staff, we walk our Thank you. 
you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, and, and, and again, I mean, it's hard for me to, to, to step right into your shoes. I know personally, the more variety that I can offer, I do a six week cycle menu in my cafeteria. Not one thing is repeated in six weeks. But what I'm saying is, so, you can make these six weeks before you have anything, they take you back one week Well, I don't I mean, you got some pretty smart kids because I can't remember three things I did six weeks ago. I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to d d d diminish your, your comment. I think a lot of this is our own mentality. Okay? I really, really do. If you want the kids to think, Display it differently. Put parsley on top of it so that it's more green than it was the last time. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but all I'm saying is you've got to find a way. We are going to bury these children if we don't find a way. Because to sit there and say all they want is chicken fried steak and french fries and whatever goes off is going to kill them, I don't buy it because Colorado has figured this out. Arizona has figured this out. New Mexico has figured this out. They're serving healthier stuff in their schools. We are behind the curve. That's a fact. I, I, I may not have all the answers, and it's something that I think we all have to congregate and work together on. You all have resources in your books to stay in contact with everybody in this room. Share your ideas. If you're struggling with things, what in the world? I can't tell you how many times I picked up the phone and called Tina over there and said, Tina, this ain't working. We have those extra recipes mm -hmm. from uh, five different schools in Colorado who have done taste tests over the last three years. And uh, these are the winning recipes from those uh, school competitions that have won. And um, tomorrow you'll have a chance to check on your sign-in sheet if you want me to email you those recipes. They're like a full lunch with a dessert or whatever. And we will have those available to you all as, as a resource. The other, th the other thing I would challenge you, another thing to avoid, is when you're purchasing items, if you purchase an item and you only use it for one menu item, shame on you. Don't buy anything unless you can go all the way across your menu with it. Okay? That way if I go out and I buy nutmeg, I gotta find, I gotta develop some recipes so that I use that nutmeg and it doesn't sit on the shelf forever. Right. The whole year. I wanted to mention this also. We made broccoli and cheese. The kids are really eager. So what I do is if I drain the broccoli, I change the water and put it in my cheese and then down my cheese and then mix it all together. And it's good like that. Well, and I'm gonna give you another Thing that we're, you're, you're going to see tomorrow. You talked about water, and I want to spend some time talking about water. Water on the surface for a kid is boring, right? So we're going to take water tomorrow, and we're going to snazz it up for them. We're going to we're going to they're going to have three different flavored waters to drink tomorrow. If they choose. One is going to be lemon. With fresh water with fresh lemon and whole fresh raspberries in it. They're going to get cucumber and mint water. And they're going to get lemon and lime water. So, again, the same thing. Oh, they won't drink water if I give it to them. They just pour it out. Change the water. I mean, if you stick your feet in cement long enough, you're stuck there. I mean, really, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be rude and mean, but I mean, just, you've got to have to think
was because those types of foods are typically higher in fat, so trying to stay within the calorie ranges was tough. The other thing at the beginning of last year when the training was done, I mean, I know I, I spent a week at HFB Wilson earlier this summer at their summer camp talking to the kids about nutrition. And I watched every single day how much of a carton, how much was four, four ounce, six ounce cartons of milk, eight ounce cartons of milk, get poured out. But we have to get it. Okay. Um, you know, my hope is that you walk away tomorrow at the end of the day feeling like you have some resources. You feel better about what you do on a daily basis. Okay. I know as a parent, I can't thank y'all enough for what you do. It goes often unrecognized. We tell the kids like on the meal to say the one percent, we had kids like water. And they won't drink that away. You know, the reality, the reality of things is this, and I know this from the school that my kids attend. Unfortunately, there's a lot of these kids that when they leave school, they have no food to go home to. Okay. Um, yeah, it is. And that's why I hope that you take this responsibility with a little bit more with a little bit more in your gut than you did when you got here this morning. Because it is that important. And I know a lot of kids, I mean, I, I did that exact same exercise with those kids at HFB Wilson. I took two big, huge bins of fruits and vegetables and to see if they could identify them. And I was pretty impressed. They nailed it. And these are First grade, all the way through what sixth, seventh grade, I think we had there. Very impressive. Uh, so I think we we we've gained. We need to give kids the respect, some respect too. They're smarter than we probably give them credit for. Um, but think like a kid. When you name your menu items, give them funky names. One of the things we're gonna have. Okay, prime example. Tomorrow we're gonna make coleslaw. How many kids would eat coleslaw? None. Do you think any of the kids might think about it if we called it Crayola coleslaw? <laughs> but if it piques their interest in food, simply by giving it a funky name. Porcupine sliders. <laughs> Do we pique their interest before they even get in line? thought about, I was, I was asking my, my son the other night, I was like, you know, because I, I go to lunch with him every once in a while, and I asked him a lot of times, I said, now, do you ever eat the carrots and celery and all that kind of stuff that they put on, you know, a little side thing, he goes, no, but the kid would drink ranch with a straw, <laughs> and I got to thinking about these little ranch packets that I had bought at one time, little foil-capped portion control ranch. I said, Caleb, I said, what if I stuck three carrot sticks inside that pool so they're just sticking up out of there? He goes, I'd eat it all day long. Yeah. 
Think like a kid. Ask the kids about food. They're going to give you a lot of answers. And I know, I know, ranch is probably not the best thing we want the kids to eat, but if it, the cost of the ranch is a, a couple of carrots. You do a low-fat and you work on these herbs instead of salt. You know, that I think you're going to get a ton of value out of the next presentation. Uh, <laughs> because of what they eat at lunch, we ask them what they want to eat, and they say, I don't care any way one people in the church. Let me ask you this. And this kind of goes along with my thinking here. If you walk into my cafeteria right now, and you were to buy a hamburger, you're going to pay, I think, $4.25 for it. But if you step away from that area and you go over to my line where I have my healthy items for the day and you get the baked chicken with corn and black bean relish and you get the steamed carrots and you get the uh, red cargo rice, you're going to pay three fifty dollars for it, the whole plate. Okay? I've made it an incentive for them to eat healthy. So... Along that line, what you've done is you've made it too easy for them to pick a cinnamon roll, a muffin, and Sunny D. Okay, one of the things that we learned when we redesigned our cafeteria was we had to change our vending machines. Okay. <clears throat> we decided to change our vending machines to a 50-50 mix. 50% sugar sodas, the other 50% healthy fruit juices, bottled water, flavored waters, things like that. And what we learned was I can put Pepsi in that vending machine, but I'm going to put it on the bottom left-hand side of the vending machine. Because most people are 5 foot, 5'8", five that's the average height. So if you kind of put the products that you want them to have right by the keypad, and where you put the money in, right here, Remember the jerk? <laughs> okay, you get to pick from here and here and here and here. Basically, this, this area right here, that's what you steer them right there. So when they're at that keypad, they look in right water. Same mentality. Move it. So right when they walk in the cafeteria, there's healthy snacks. There's 100% fruit juice. Maybe that's where you put your salad bar or a fresh fruit bar something like that, instead of the stuff you don't want them to buy. Well, it's not uh, not only the, cap the cafeteria, it's uh, part of the school, they have a snack for, you know, for raising money for the team or stuff like that. You send them sometimes pizza packets or something. But we know that in July of next year, those they're going to be under the same standards that you are in the cafeteria. So, I mean, I know that's a tough battle to fight. I don't know that you're going to win it in the next year. Somebody's going to enter the game that's going to win it for you. In July. Okay. All right, any other questions? We've got about 10 minutes till we start lunch. I need to correct the typo. Sure. On page, on slide 49, where it, at the top it says nutrient requirements continue, fat limit. 49.
Less than. <laughs> less than. Okay. Less than thirty-five percent of calories. And I apologize for that error. Okay. When we go to lunch, you're going to have kind of a working lunch that we've got planned for you. Okay, so we got some door prizes here we're going to do. Ticket number 465.